a culture that says follow your heart, right? Even in sports, like follow your heart. Pick the player that, that you feel the most connected with, which I know that's ridiculous, but we live in a culture that says follow your heart. But the problem is, is scripture tells us, like I said earlier, that the heart is deceitful above all things. And scripture says to guard your heart above all, above all else because it is the wellspring of life. But we live in a culture that says do what feels good, do what seems right, follow your heart, follow your emotions, follow it, follow it, follow it. But the problem is, and, and if anyone in this place who has followed their heart before, you know that it, it leads to brokenness. It leads to, to, to uh, pain. It leads to heartbreak. When you follow your heart, it will deceive you. It, it, it will lead you astray. It will take you places that you never wanted to go. And as we're going to see tonight from the scripture that we're reading tonight, we're going to see that your heart is ultimately the source of all sin. This is Jesus. This isn't my opinion. This is Jesus speaking again to the Pharisees. I'm going to read this here in a minute, but just for context, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of that culture. Uh, they were, they, they, they kind of held themselves in a high, at, at a higher level because they had the law memorized and followed it to the T. They dotted every I and crossed every T and they thought they were better than. They thought God approved of them more because they followed the, the religion. They followed the rules perfectly and they did it all right and 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 so this is who Jesus is talking to as, as I read this tonight I'm going to just share a couple other things it says this in verse 14 of, of Mark chapter 7 and he called to the, the people to him again and said to them hear me all of you and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Everyone say, out of. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples, so the 12 guys that followed Jesus, asked him about the parable. And he said, then are you also without understanding? In other translations, it's Jesus says, really, you still don't get it? Are you without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Then by saying this, he declared all foods clean. I'm going to explain that here in a second. And he said, and here's where we're going to live most of the night is, is this next portion. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the hearts of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, adultery, murder, Coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Come on, we're going to preach tonight. Let's pray. Jesus, we invite your Holy Spirit into this room. We ask for you to do what only you can do. Only you can do. God, our hearts are open, our hearts are receptive to what you want to speak to us. And God, like every week, our goal is that we would leave this place looking more like you. That we would have an encounter with you that would transform us from the inside out. And we would leave this place loving better, showing grace better and mercy better. God, in, the, in a very, very broken world. So Lord, I pray that we would leave this place looking more like you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Before I jump into this, I want to say this. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, and I want to challenge you. When I get on this microphone, it is not me speaking. God has put a word on my heart that I am speaking, and it is God speaking through me to you. Yes, my personality is going to be, and I'm going to use personal stories, but God is, this is a message from God to you. This, I didn't come up with this. Everything I'm talking about tonight comes from the word of God, and I believe he brought you into this gym tonight for a reason. And so here's what I'm going to ask. For the next 20 minutes, don't be on your phones unless you've unless you're got your Bible open. Don't go to the bathroom unless it's an emergency. Don't, don't talk to the person next to you. Zero in because God of, of all the earth and all the heavens and all the universe, he led you to this place. Whether it was by a friend because your mom made you or just because you got invited. However you ended up here tonight, I believe that God led you into this place because he has a message for you. So can you all do that for the next 20 minutes? Just zero in on what God has for you. Come on. I believe God has something for me too. So even when I'm speaking, I'm saying, God, my heart's open to what you want to do in my life. Okay, so we read scripture like this, and honestly, we're a little confused. In 2021, in American culture, 
we're a little confused by what Jesus is saying because he's like talking about what goes into you, like doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of you. And then it says, by saying this, he declared all food clean. And just a little kind of side note, uh, he, Jesus is talking about specific foods that were considered unclean. He's not talking about drugs and alcohol or what you listen to, what you put before your eyes, because those things actually can hurt you. Those things actually can detour you from God's perfect plan for your life. What God is, was, is taught, what Jesus is talking about here is these foods that were considered unclean by Jewish tradition, by Jewish culture, by the law. And so here's what you need to understand. When Jesus said this in this time in history, it was crazy. It was revolutionary. Because here's, here's the deal. There's actually, uh, in, in history, if you look back in Jewish history, there were times where these, these dysfunctional leaders rose up to power and they would, they would try to get Jewish people to eat some of these defiled foods. So, for example, uh, pork is, is considered an unclean food. If you eat pork, it'll actually defile your soul, defile your heart. So literally, there's times in Jewish history where, where kings and rulers would raise up and they would force the Jewish people to eat food or else they would kill them. And literally, Jews would refuse. They believed in this so much. This was so much a part of their heart, their, their system, their culture, that they would literally give their lives up rather than to eat a defiled food. I read a story in one of the commentaries I was reading. There was a, a mom, or, or uh, yeah, there was a mom who literally, her, her kids were being tortured because they wouldn't eat defiled food. And she was cheering them on, like, come on, you can do it. Stray, stay strong for God. Like, keep with it. And I tell you this, and you're like, dang, that's really intense. I'm, this is, I'm sharing this with you so you can understand that when Jesus is saying, hey, it doesn't really matter what you eat. It just goes in you and out of you. It doesn't really affect your soul. There's no doubt people are going, wait, wh wh what did he just say? Our ancestors have died for these laws. We have held these, like, like literally, we, we have stuck to these things to honor God. And now this guy's showing up on the scene telling us, ah, don't worry about it. It's all about the heart. And so this was revolutionary. This would have, like, blown the minds of the Jews in this culture of, like, wait, what is he saying? And that's why we read this. We're like, why don't the disciples get it? But these disciples were Jewish men. And they didn't understand. That's why they were like, wait, what, what are you saying, Jesus? And Jesus is like, oh, you still don't get it. And so when Jesus said this, it was revolutionary, but it was still true that what really matters is the heart. And the only thing that can defile you is what comes from your heart. And Jesus gives us a list of, honestly, a, a, some sins that are, like, it's not even fun to read. It's like, oh, like, I don't want to hear about those things. But what Jesus is saying is that the heart is the source of life. Your heart is the center of who you are. When, when the Bible says heart, it's not talking about your physical organ. It's talking about your inner being. It's talking about the center of who you are, the, the wellspring of life, like it talks about in Proverbs. It's, it's, it's your mind, it's your will, and it's your emotions. And that's what, that's what we're going to break down tonight. And Jesus is saying when your heart is, is messed up, when your heart is dysfunctional, when your heart is dirty, what comes out of it is going to look like these things. And I think we can all look at culture today and go, yeah. Man, if you look around this world, you can see that the hearts of people, the intents of people is broken. And because of that, we are seeing things, sins rise and, 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 and sex slavery and, and porn addiction and horrible things, murders and, and, and crime just rising because the hearts of people are broken. Heartache, uh, depression, divorce, hatred towards one another. Man, we live in a world where people have followed their hearts and it's led to a broken society. And wherever we all stand on different opinions politically, I think we can all agree. The one thing we can agree on is, man, something is broken. And I would like to pose tonight that what's broken is the hearts of people. What's broken tonight is the wellspring of life that Jesus <laughs> describes you tonight. So again, what I want to challenge you tonight is don't follow your heart, but lead your heart. And the first way you lead your heart is renew your mind. So my, uh, one of the uh, study Bibles I use is called the Fire Bible. I've been using it uh, since I was like a freshman in high school. I actually love it. Um, and they break down the heart to your mind, your will, and your emotion. So what we're going to do is kind of focus in on how do we lead our hearts through those three things, our mind, our will, and our emotion. And the first way is to renew your mind. Your mind can be defined as your intellect, your thoughts, and your mindsets. What's interesting I mean, this has been a hot topic, I think, because 
uh, mental health is such a, a, a hot topic in culture that science and, and doctors and, and um, psychiatrists have really dug in and studying this. And what, what we're finding um, scientifically is that, that the mind, your brain health is extremely important. The, the health of your mind, the health of your brain actually matters. And what's, what's interesting is the Bible actually has a lot to say about your mind, about your thoughts, about the things that you dwell on. I just picked three random ones, um, but honestly, you could go and find dozens and dozens of scriptures, um, which is just proof to show that the Bible is relevant today. The Bible already knew what science is proving, and we see that more and more, not just in this area, but so many different areas. But just a few, Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by, and I love this line, changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Colossians 3.2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Romans 8.6 says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is is life and peace. All through scripture, it emphasizes mental health. And so we live in a, in a mental health age where this is a, a topic that we are, a conversation we're having in tons of different rooms across our nation because mental health matters. And the Bible knew this from the beginning. Jesus taught that, that the way you think actually matters because your thoughts are connected to your heart, right? Your, your thoughts, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Uh, there's a pastor uh, by the name of Craig Rochelle. Uh, he's pretty famous in church circles. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, we actually, so he wrote a book uh, during uh, cor the quarantine and all the craziness. Uh, it, it was called uh, Waging the War in Your Mind. And, and the whole book was about changing the way you think. In fact, the, the thing he says through the book over and over and over again is this. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thought. Let that sink in for a moment. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thought. We actually read this book. Our student interns, uh, hopefully they read it. They were supposed to read it. Uh, we read this book over the summer um, because, man, I just felt coming out of all the COVID stuff. Man, we needed to get our minds focused on Jesus, focused on the things of God, focused on positive things. Um, and that's what this book is all about. Now, here's, I, I do want to say this. Uh, me and Hayden actually had a conversation a couple months ago. And, and you know, in, in church circles, sometimes there's this idea that we can, like, speak things into existence, right? Or, like, if you have a negative thought, like, it's going to come into reality. Well, well, here, it's not really, like, this magical thing where, like, oh, I had a bad thought and now something bad's going to happen. What it is is, is when you... When you allow your mind to dwell on darkness, when you allow your mind to dwell on sin, when you allow your mind to dwell on negativity, naturally what's going to come out of you is darkness and negativity, right? Like, and so it's this idea where if, if you continue to dwell on something, you're going to naturally lead yourself in that direction. So it's not like this, like, this magic thing where like, oh, you spoke something negative into existence. It's that if we continue to dwell on things, we're going to lead our life towards those things because your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thought. Thank you, Craig Rochelle. And so I just want to ask you some questions, some practical questions when it comes to our minds. And it's this, what are you allowing to shape and direct your mind? What are you dwelling on? What are you reading to develop your intellect? Are you listening to men and women who love God or are you listening to culture? Are you filling your mind with the word of God? Are you filling your mind with sexual, explicit, vulgar, violent, and negative content? The way you think matters. And the Bible says that the heart is the wellspring of life. And our, part of our heart is our mind. And so if our mind isn't focusing on the things of God, the things that are going to come out of us aren't going to be the things of God. The things that are going to come out of us is going to be the list that Jesus reads in the scripture that we read tonight. The second thing is this, and how we lead our hearts and not follow our hearts. It's this, purify your will. Purify your will. Your will can be defined as your desires, motivation, purpose, resolve, or ability to choose. So here's the thing. When your will is broken, when your desires are, are, are messed up, when your motivation is wrong, when your ability to make choices is broken, uh, you're going to find yourself in places you never wanted to be. When, when your motivation is off, when your desires are off, you'll find yourself manipulating other people around you to get what you want. 
When your motivation is off, you'll find yourself using other people, using a boyfriend or a girlfriend, using a sibling, using people that you love, and it leads to hurting people. It leads to, to, to pushing people away. It leads to selfishness as opposed to selflessness. If your will, your will, if it goes unchecked, can lead you to places you never thought possible. And I'm going to prove it. So I'm going to read some, some statistics that, that are not fun to hear. But I looked this up, and, and here's just a couple statistics. It says one in five women have experienced attempted or completed rape. Almost 25% of men in the U.S. experience some form of contact sexual violence in their lifetime. It is estimated that in, in uh, the next year, 734,000 people will be raped. Now, okay, you're like, what in the world? We just took a sharp turn. Here's why I say that. No one wakes up. No one wakes up and go, and, and don't laugh when I say this, because I know it sounds really intense, but I'm making a point. No one wakes up and go, when I grow up, I want to be a rapist. Right? But yet we have these statistics, and, and my heart breaks because according to these statistics, there's some of you who have experienced this. And can I just pause for a moment and say I'm sorry if you've experienced this? Like... I am so sorry. You should have never have faced that. You should have never gone through that. That person should have never done that to you. But this is reality. How is this reality if no one wakes up going, I'm going to do that one day? No one, no one does that. And here's the reason why. Because when our will goes unchecked and you multiply that by years, the selfish motivation, the selfish desires, the selfish motivation on how you make decision, it continues to grow and grow and grow and you find yourself in a compromised situation. And here's the thing. It's going to look different for all of us. I, I hit on it last week. I've seen pastors that have used their position and their authority to hurt other people and to lord it over them. Well, how did they get to that point? point because there was a point in their life where they loved Jesus and all they wanted to do was build the kingdom of God but they let their will they let their desires they let their motivations go unchecked over years and now instead of using their position to lead people to the love of God they're using their position to get what they want and to control the people around them an unchecked will will lead us to places we never wanted to be honestly take a moment and ask yourself why do you do what you do? What is your motivation? What are your desires? Are they pleasing to God? How do you make decisions with wisdom, humility, and selflessness, or with selfishness and impulse? This is so important. So we have our minds, man, keeping our mind on the things of God, but then we got to stop and go, why am I doing this? What's my motivation? Is that a love for people or is it the control and to somehow work an angle where I can satisfy my desires? And our last thing is this on how do you lead your heart? And it says process your emotions. So we renew our minds, we check our will, and we process our emotions. Process our emotions. The worship team, you guys can go ahead and join me. Let me start by saying this. Emotions are good. Emotions are are not a bad thing. Emotions make life more beautiful, right? Emotions bring depth to relationship. When I met my wife, there was de definite emotion. I, I fell in love with her, right? She captivated my heart. Emotion brings, it brings life to relationships and, and, and allows you to feel life and not just live it. Um, uh, emotions, uh, when they were properly processed with, with God and the Holy Spirit, ha have led to orphanages being started. It, they have led to people, people being rescued from sex slavery. Uh, they've, been, they've been used to, 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 to care for the hurting and the poor and, and the hungry. Emotions can lead us to great things. Jesus had emotions. You can see in Scripture there were things that made Jesus angry. When, when he was at the temple and he saw people selling at, at the church, using it as, as a business commerce and, and not to, to lead people to God, and Jesus was angry. He even flipped the tables over because they were using it for the wrong reason. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus cried. It says he wept with those around him who wept. Jesus had emotions, and dare I say, even God had emo has emotions. Currently, like he, he feels, he cares, he loves Emotions are not bad. In fact, I would even say that our emotions are one of the things that, that, 
that when, when it says we're made in the image of God, we have emotions. Like animals don't necessarily have emotions like we have emotions because that is something where we are made in the image of God. So emotions in and of themselves are not bad. And just a quick little side note to my guys. Guys, it's not wrong uh, to hold back emotion or it's, it's, not, it's not wrong to be emotional. It's not manly to, to not be emotional. Um, man, real men cry, right? Pastor Mike Gorkachea, Mike cries all the time. <laughs> uh, and ladies, if you're with a guy who suppresses his emotions, he's probably not the guy you wanna be with. Just a little side note. And vice versa, vice versa. Girls, it's okay to process your emotions. It's okay to feel your emotions. But with all that being said, emotions also lead to a lot of bad things. Wars have started out of emotion. Man, irrational decisions have come from emotion. Broken hearts have come from emotion. Uh, emotion can, can, can I, would, I could make the argument that, that emotion oftentimes, or anytime we are living in regret, I could argue that it's because of an emotional decision that was made, that instead of slowing down and processing the decision, you made a decision out of emotions and it led you to a place of regret. And so it's so imperative that we process our emotions, that we deal with our emotions, but we don't do it alone and we don't even, don't even necessarily do it with someone else, but that we process our emotions with Jesus. And yes, you can process with each other as well, but ultimately that in our, we, we take our emotions to God and ask him to align our emotions up with his will, align our hearts up to his heart. It was so imperative that we process our emotions. So part of my job as a father is, is to help my children process their emotions. Um, and you guys have, I think most of you have met my kids uh, and I, I talk about them a lot because I love them and they make great sermon illustrations. Um, but my son is highly emotional right now. Um, literally, last night I was trying to be like a good dad. I'm like, hey, mom's out with the girls. Do you guys want a snack? I didn't even tell her this, I'll probably get in trouble. And so I pulled, I got the fruit snacks out of the cupboard and I gave them both their own bag of fruit snacks. Um, and I took one. There's like probably 15 or 20 fruit snacks in the little bag. I took one of his fruit snacks and the kid lost his mind. Like you would have thought, like I just, I was like, I'm gonna starve you for the next week of your life. I took one fruit snack, just one, and, and he lost his ever loving mind because as a child, he's, he's still immature in his emotions. And sometimes as a father, uh, and this happens, you know, a lot at this season of life. I have to get down on my knees. I have to get on his level and either hold his head or hold his shoulders and say, Jackson, it's okay, buddy. Just relax. Just breathe. Side note, my wife is way better at this than me, but I'm going to make myself look good right now. I'll get on his level and I'll talk him through it. Or I'll say, ja oh, sometimes I'll even get serious. Jackson, it's okay. You need to control yourself. And I'll hold him. And 99% of the time when I get on his level and I speak to him, He'll relax and he'll calm down and he'll understand that this wasn't worth the fight that he was wanting to put up. And here's what I wanna to say to you tonight. I, I understand as teenagers, you are dealing with emotions. You, you are, the, even, even scientists have said, you are the most stressed out generation who's ever lived. You have so much pressure from culture, from social media, from your parents, to school, to sports, to what college you're gonna go to. You're like expected to know what you're gonna do for the rest of your life at the age of 14. People are like, what are you gonna do for the rest of your life? You're like, I don't know. I just wanna enjoy high school. And, and you live under more pressure than any generation has ever lived under. So I understand there's emotions. And not to mention that, if we, if we look at the last two years of, of of the pandemic and the racial uh, tension in our world. And you're just like, I just wanna love everyone. Why does our world have to be so jacked up? And everything that's going on, all the opinions of Democrat, Republican, what the news is saying, what culture is saying, what social media is saying. And there's a lot of emotions. And on top of that, you're growing into the men and women of God that he's called you to be. And so your body's changing, you're dealing with all this stuff. Here's all I wanna say to you tonight. It's okay to feel emotion. It's okay to feel anxiety. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel hurt. All I'm asking you tonight is in your emotions, allow God 
to get on your level and to hold you and say, it's gonna be okay. This isn't as big of a deal as you think it's gonna, as you think it is. 10 free years from now, you're not gonna be so worried about it. Just breathe. Focus your emotions on the things that matter. Focus your emotions on the things of God. Focus your emotions on, on, on the broken, lost, and hurting people of this world. It's okay. Focus on the things that actually matter. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. It's okay. And process your emotions with God and then do this. Make, one, make your prayer this. I wrote this down, and this is actually, uh, it's, it's based from scripture, but it's lyrics from an old worship song. So come to God in your emotions, allow him to hold you and him to comfort you, and then, and then pray this prayer to God. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. I know you've given me emotion. I know that's from you, it's not a bad thing, but God, I ask that, that you would help me to, to, to be emotional about the things that are worth being emotional about, that my, my emotions would motivate me to live out the calling of God on my life. So God, here's what I'm dealing with, here's where I'm stressed out, here's where I'm feeling emotional. Comfort me, Lord, but then God, redirect my emotions and break my heart for what breaks yours. Break my heart for the lost. Break my heart for the abused. Break my heart for the nations. God, break my heart for my school. Break my heart for my mom and dad who don't know true peace and true joy. God, break my heart for the people who don't know you. So go to God in your emotions and say, God, realign my heart. Unintentionally, this song, Refiner, has become kind of our theme song in this series. In fact, we're probably just gonna just do this song throughout the whole series. Last week, I asked if they could do it at the end of service and I didn't know they already had it scheduled for this week. Um, but I, I, just, I, think, I just think it's prophetic that, that this is the song that's been kind of playing throughout this series and it's this heart of refiner. God, I wanna burn for you, God. Refine me, make me more like you, purify me. And so, kind of like last week, I just want us to take a moment and I want us to allow God to purify our hearts, to clean our hearts, and to make us more like him. And so one last time, the way we lead our hearts and not follow our hearts is first by renewing our minds, changing the way we think, focusing on the things of God, filling our minds up with the word of God and the promises of God and the truth of God. The second way is that we purify our will, that we, 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 we are constantly tweaking and, and, and fixing our desires and our motivation to God and the work of God and the plans of God. And the last one is that we process our emotions. We process them with Jesus and ask him to realign our emotions for the things that he's emotional about. And so I'm just gonna ask you just to go ahead and stand up in this place. And I'm gonna make it super simple with every eye open and, and every head up. If, if you want to continue this refinement process of God making you more like Jesus, I'm going to ask you right now just to come to this altar. Just come up to the altar. Come to the altar. I want to renew your mind. Process your emotions. Focus your will. across this room, or just if you're in these altars, just close your eyes and, and kind of open your hands out in front of you as a sign of, of, of letting go, as a sign of allowing the Holy Spirit to come in, the Spirit of God to come in. And before they start singing, I just want you to start praying. And so if it's a mindset, if it's a thought process, just begin to pray right now. God, help me with my thoughts. Help me to not dwell on the negativity. Help me not to dwell on impure things. Help me not to dwell on, 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 on hurtful things and dark things. If it's your motivations, your desires, you found yourself manip being manipulative or trying to control other people, say, God, purify my will. God, help me to, to get my motivations in the right place that the reason I do what I do is for the right reasons. God, make me more like Jesus. Help me have the, the ability to choose better. God, help me to, 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 to know why I do what I do, Lord, and, and make it more like you. If it's emotions, if you're struggling with emotions and you just feel like you're all over the place, you're going from being angry to feeling hate, to feeling sad, to feeling depressed, back to being angry, over to being anxious, and you just feel like your emotions are all over the place, just begin praying yourself and asking, God, help me. God, help me with my mind. God, help me with my motivations and my will. God, help me.
with my emotions. God, come on. Thank you so much for watching tonight's message. We hope it impacted your life. Man, we hope it challenged you and made you more like Jesus. Man, we would love for you to subscribe to our channel. And also, we would love for you to join us in person. So make sure you come out this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We love you. No one belongs here more than you. Thank you.